know when you want me to show that. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone who's joining us today. Um, I'm Jennifer Lynch. I'm the director here at the Mountain Lakes Public Library and joining us today in our second of our fall lecture series is Dave Curran, the Emmy award winning meteorologist on News 12 New Jersey. Um, thanks for joining us, Dave, and thank you for ordering this absolutely perfect day for us. <laughs> if I'm going to get blamed for it, I might as well take credit for it, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Especially since we're all indoors. We could have gone either way today. That's true. So That's I'm going to start today with um, a clip because I, you have kind of a rabid fan base in New Jersey, and I know that because I have some friends and, and, and family who are among them. And um, I think this clip that I'm about to show shows your popularity, why, why people relate to you so well. Ian, you wanna go ahead and show that clip? Yes. Hold on, we have to screen share. Hold on one second. When was that, Dave? Was that August? Uh, yeah, August. probably. Yeah. It, just, it was, it wasn't that long ago. This is always fun. Good times. So to all of us working from home, we can relate. Yeah. Start to your uh, Wednesday with some scattered showers and isolated storms. And when we get into the tomorrow afternoon, it's a mixture of sun and clouds and temperatures that are- Life right here. And lower 80s. Not the greatest- Good times. <laughs> you didn't miss a beat. Why? Well, beat. Yeah, you know, th this is like one of the, the crazier things about working from home is that you, you're, you're, you're dealing with so many other variables outside and around you um, that it, it's, it's kind of confusing. And I can, I'll, I'll easily kind of get lost in where I'm supposed to be. And, and, I, and I saw my son actually, you know, walking up to the door. You know, I mean, it's right there. And I, I saw the shadow coming in. And I'm going... <laughs> Can't stop it. Can't stop it. Don't wait. Can't do anything like this. No, not yet. Um, so I just came in and he's got moves, man. He, he, he kind of danced through that thing real quick, which I thought he was, was great. good. He was good. So, um, yeah, just take us through whatever you want to tell us about, uh, how you started and. Oh, well, you know, I had a very, um, unconventional approach to getting to, uh, where I am right now. Um, I wasn't one of those, uh, people that knew from like age four looking out the window and I saw my first hurricane or saw my first, uh, snowstorm. Um, I knew, you know, right then and there, I was going to be a meteorologist. I'm, I was a late bloomer in just about everything that I, that I didn't do. Um, I, I was not very good in school. Uh, I, I wanted to be anywhere else other than in that classroom. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of people call them daydreamers. Uh, you know, I could have had OCD, ADHD. I mean, who knows? I'm not diagnosed or anything like that, but I would sit in the classroom and I would just, just, God, I want to be somewhere else. I want to, be, I, you know, just anywhere other than the classroom. So school to me was always very hard. Um, and I, I got into uh, surfing. Uh, when I was probably seventh or eighth grade. Uh, yeah, seventh or eighth grade. Started skateboarding and then, you know, kind of worked my way into uh, surfing. I've always been a, a water baby, always been a water rat. And um, I started doing, there's my wife, say, hey, look, this is this is art imitating everything. This is life right know. now. The whole kitchen was snowing. Yeah, the whole kitchen's <laughs> going. Hi. <laughs> say hi. Okay. I can't um, even know. I'm going to just make some food. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> See you later. But, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I had my, my, um, my work epiphany, what I wanted to do in life, uh, late in life. I was, I was surfing. Uh, I was out with a bunch of friends, um, every day, you know, surfing took, took over everything. Um, I would call, uh, surf lines, um, twice a day, uh, just to see what the surf conditions were. Could I go? Can I go? Can I, you know, hop in a cart, you know, with a friend and we go down the shore and, and surf for a few hours, come back home. That was, that was my life. Um, and my, my parents were always kind of like, they didn't really know what to do with me with school. So, um, one day I'm sitting in the water, having a great time with friends and it hit me. I'm going, you know, instead of calling the surf line, 
spending, you know, 75 cents to a dollar each call. Um, wouldn't it be great if I could forecast the waves? Um, and that way I'd never miss a swell. I'd always be out in the water. Um, so I, I, had the, I had the epiphany, in order, in order to get waves, you need wind. You get wind, I gotta be a meteorologist. Boom, and there it was. And I came home from that, that, that surf session and it, I, was, I was a senior in high school. Um, and I came home and I was so excited. And I told my parents, I was like, I am gonna go to school to become a meteorologist. And they, I mean, both of them looked at me and they were just like, you're terrible in math and science. What are you thinking? I was like, nope, gonna do it. I, I can do this, don't worry about a thing. And, um, you know, got through high school. I went to Union County College for two years um, and found my way into uh, Kane University's, back then it was Kane College, and then it was a uh, university. Um, I, I worked my way into uh, their meteorology program, which was great because it was a, a small class size. Uh, there was, I think I graduated with maybe 11 people. And that was what I needed to be. I needed to be in a lecture hall or a small classroom where my professors could help me through the math. And the math that, that I went through, I mean, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done that. Um, I had to go through calculus one, calculus two, calculus three, differential equations, physics one, physics two, thermal dynamics, uh, uh, meteorological instrumentation. I thought that was gonna be a great class, meteorological instrumentation. I'm gonna be learning about thermometers, I'm gonna be learning about barometers, it's gonna be like really cool. It was the math behind thermometers and barometers and hygrometers. And I'm sitting there in class going, oh, I may have made a big, big mistake. But I didn't. I mean, it was it, when you find something that you have so much passion for that you really love, you find a way to get the work done. Um, I had, I honestly had, I mean, I was so bad in math that I was taking, I was taking an exam and we're filling out, you know, all of these, these crazy equations. And, and these crazy long equations are just for like one, one one hundredth of a meteorological forecast. So we're learning how, you know, how the atmosphere works. And I, I'm trying to figure something out and I go to my professor and just like, all right, so here, here I got it. And he looks at it and I got the right answer. He's just like, how did you come up with this answer? And I tried to prove to him my steps in, in my math ability. And he's like, none of that was right. None of that. Is, how are you even thinking? What? I'm like, I don't know. That's how my mind works. So, um, yeah, I was, I was a ter terrible, terrible uh, student. Uh, but I got through it. Um, I worked when I graduated. Um, I thought I was, I never thought I was going to go into the, the television aspect of it. I, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I did two internships. Uh, the first internship was at a TV station in Austin, Texas. So I took a summer. I went down there. Uh, for a few months, and that was my first taste of being in the studio, being around uh, the lights, the cameras, uh, the control room, you know, producers talking in your ear. Uh, it's, there's something really electric about that. Uh, I, I thought I'd want to go into more derivatives, uh, more of a, I don't want to call it like a Wall Street approach, but I mean, you're doing commodities. Uh, so I thought I would probably maybe go in that direction. And I, I dabbled for a little bit. Uh, when I first graduated, I had uh, a couple of jobs in uh, the, the private sector. So, you know, working for a, a small meteorological firm, coming up with forecasts, doing audio broadcasts for areas, coming up with text forecasts and, you know, sending that out to all sorts of, of, of places. Uh, clients. And I kind of always went back to, wow, TV was pretty cool. So I did my second internship and that was at News 12 New Jersey when they first started. And uh, I had a mentor there. His name was Scott Haney. Uh, he was the weekend meteorologist at News 12 New Jersey. 
And he was there for maybe about a year. And he was, I mean, just absolutely great. He would always have me in front of the green screen and he would always try to critique me in, in what I was doing and what I was saying and how I should, how I should try to bring my approach, um, get, get me a little bit more focused on where I was supposed to be, uh, become more conversational in the forecast. Cause a lot of folks will just look at it and it's slide by slide by slide by slide. And a lot of, people when they first get into doing broadcast meteorology. Well, as you can see, the current temperatures are this, and then they click and it goes to, and as you can see, the satellite radar composite does this. It's a matter of trying to become a lot more conversational in your approach that will drive the weather story. So when he was, he was constantly working on me, working with me, he, he left News 12 New Jersey, went up to our sister station in, um, Westchester. So he's the morning meteorologist for uh, Westchester. And then he was there for maybe about a year. And in that time, I had graduated. Uh, I was just getting married. Uh, I was, I had to figure out what I wanted to do in, in life because TV is, you, it's very hard to break into television. Um, and so when he was, he was leaving News 12 Westchester to go to a Fox affiliate in Hartford, Connecticut, where he is still today. He owns the Connecticut market. Um, he's been on David Letterman. He's, you know, done a whole bunch of different things. Just an amazing uh, broadcaster and meteorologist. When he was leaving, he told that news director, he was just like, I know who my, my replacement is. You don't have to look far. It's, it's Dave. And that news director was like, I don't know. He's never worked anywhere. And Scott was just like, trust me, just, Try them out. So I worked for a month, two months. I was working for two months. So I was doing mornings in Westchester and then I was doing, um, I was working a full-time job as a customer service rep for an insurance company. And after, after about two months, they, they finally hired me in News 12 Westchester. And then the opening in News 12 New Jersey happened a few few years later, and I took that. So I'm, you know, this is where I've been. I've I've been in with the News 12 family for about 20 years, um, and I've seen, you know, a lot of things, you know, happen within within the uh, the market or with, within you know meteorology and and broadcasting as a whole. So, you know, it's it's been a, a fun a fun wild ride uh, doing doing what I do. Um, I could give you an idea of, I'm going to, I'm going to screen share and I'm going to show you, uh, basically what, what I kind of do in a day in five seconds. Um, the first thing I do is when I wake up, I, I always check, you know, the weather maps. I check weather charts, um, weather's 365 days a year, 24 seven. Um, while I only work five days a week, I am always checking and looking at the trends of the forecasts. What, where, where are things going? Did my forecast go horribly wrong? Is it right? You know, why is it, why did it go horribly wrong? Um, not only that, but we've got social media to contend with. So posting on social media, I, you know, I want to try to have a good forecast there. Um, let me see if I can screen share really quick. Uh, just some of the, 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 the weather data that I kind of look at in so this is can you see my i don't know if you guys can can you guys see my cursor i don't know if anyone can talk yeah. okay so this is basically um weather data that we you know you learn to read and it's all numbers but it all means something in um meteorology and you know you've got a, a short range model then you have your long range model um and that's a different short range model we try to average the two to see what's going on there um, so we look at numerical data. I look at uh, graphical data. This is uh, one particular model, uh, Tropical Tidbits. It's a free site. Anyone can hop on uh, and look at it. Uh, you know, we look at short range uh, model guidance. I'm zooming into the Northeast, get you an idea of what's happening there. Um, and, you know, we kind of go through a bunch of different, you know, this is basically looking at, this is the North American model at three kilometers. Uh, this is uh, the precipitation and mean sea, sea level pressure and thickness. So there's a bunch of different things that you're looking at where there's a storm coming, where does the rain placement, uh, how warm the temperatures are. All of that is within this 
within this one map. And then you can change your, your look to give you uh, what is the upper level temperature, you know, doing. Uh, that would, you know, kind of derive where some really cold air is coming, how the clouds are going to develop. Uh, lower dynamics, you could look at winds um, and wind gusts, where, where the storm is going to be. So, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of different things that within, just within this one site, I'm looking at. Uh, and I usually go over at least, at least six different models in a day. So that, that was just the North American model. And there's the GFS, the Global uh, Forecasting System, which is hopefully going to get a, an upgrade very soon because it hasn't been, you know, that great. Um, what was the, oh, I wanted to do this, sorry. Uh, there was the European, everyone you know, talks about the European model. Um, this is Weather Bell, this is a pay, for, a pay site. Um, but again, there's, there's a whole bunch of different things, you know, that we look at within just one particular, you know, one particular model. Um, and that's where surface, I want surface pressure. I don't know if that, well, anyway, um, I see, I, I'll, I'll just get scatterbrained and I'm like, oh, wait, look, something else. I'm like Dory from uh, Finding Nemo. Uh, so that's, so once I get an idea of where the forecast is going, I will then go over to my work computer. And I broke into that just for you guys to, to show you what's going on. Um, and then I make my graphics. So this particular, I didn't make the graphics today because I'm not working. Um, we had Justin Godnick in the morning and Michelle Powers is working uh, this evening. But just to give you an idea of what what I see compared to what you see. You see just, you know, a seamless, you know, map movement. But each, each one, each graphic is like a, a slideshow. Uh, and I think this is playing for some reason. Let me see if I can close this. Hang on. Yeah, there we go. So each, each one of these is called an element. And the element needs to be you know, worked on and, and the forecast needs to be, you know, played around with each graphic. Um, you know, I have, I have full control over so I can, you know, edit however I want to do when, when I want your pictures. If I ask for pictures on social media, we can, you know, get them in there. Um, so if you know my social media sites on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, if you ever want to share pictures with me, uh, that's amazing. And I love that. And we will, you know, put them on, on TV, uh, for you guys. Uh, that's just, you know, one, one thing here. Let's see. There's a bunch of different windows kind of showing where I'm going. Um, so once, once I figure out what I want to do and how I want to tell the show, how I want to tell the weather story, I will place these elements in an order. So I will kind of have an idea of what I'm going to say next. Um, so let's see, this was a particular forecast that I was doing. So I'll put it into play. Um, I'll usually have a clicker or I will have my, when I'm working from home, my clicker is my keyboard and it's a space bar button. And I will look straight ahead into my camera nowadays. is isn't like one of those real expensive cameras. It's, it's literally my iPhone with an app on it. And it sits in front of a, a light and I just talk. So what I will do is we will talk about however we want to, you know, play around with it. Wind speeds would go to high temperatures today. So far, it's only 66 in the Morristown area. Normally, it's about 70. 89 is the record. We can expand our view, and we've got some rain showers offshore, another frontal boundary through the Great Lakes, down through the Ohio Valley. This is going to be the wet weather that moves in later on tonight. So um, if you've got your patio furniture out on the back deck like I do because I was trying to power wash, start bringing that stuff inside because late tonight going into tomorrow, the clouds are going to start to collect and we're going to start to see some rain showers uh, developing. Here's our future cast model, which will show, you know, the rain showers, you know, showing up late tonight, early tomorrow morning. It's on again, off again, showers for your Monday, um, which will probably go into Tuesday as well. If I'm, uh, no, it'll probably hopefully start to end right around Monday. And then here's your forecast. And then I can go right here to the next day. And then I would go into your seven day, now your exclusive 10 day forecast, and it would be something along those lines. So it's each, each element is 
made and, and put together in a specific order to tell a weather story. Um, and that's basically, you know, how I've been, how I've been, you know, doing that for God, 20 years now. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's been, it's been fun. I don't, I really don't know what else I'd want to do in life other than, you know, uh, whether I have such a, a fun time doing it. Um, I love building the graphics. I love making the forecast. There's, there's something, um, autonomous, autonomous about it, which, you know, this is all me. I'm on an Island. Uh, this is my forecast. If I blow it, I take responsibility for it. If I get it right, cool, let's move on to the next forecast. Um, and then social media is also, you know, something that is brand new to broadcasting. Uh, we have to uh, try to be on as many platforms as possible to appeal to as many people as possible. Um, so trying to trying to get the message out in a fun, reliable way is also something that we're we're slowly learning. Uh, it's 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 something new. Usually it was you know you had your your tech. Most people got their most people got their, their weather at one point was from the, the newspaper and then it was from the radio. Then it was from TV. Now most people are literally looking on their phone, kind of looking up at the TV and then looking back down on their phone. So trying to get the best of both worlds is uh, where we're at right now. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have any questions? Kind of like all over the place. So, um, I'll say if you have a question, it looks like there's already one in the chat box from Vivian. Oh yeah, that's right. I got it. I'm really bad at, at Zoom. It's um, we're learning as we go. It's a it's a ah Vivian. Hi Vivian. Uh, what town did I go to school? Uh, I grew up in Cranford, New Jersey. Um, so I went through. I was born in Elizabeth. I went to first grade in Elizabeth. My parents moved to Cranford, so from like the mid mid first first grade through high school. Um, I was, I was a Cranford Cougar and then I was a Kane college Cougar. Weird. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, and, and it took me, I mean, it took me forever to graduate cause I was enjoying college too much. There was a, there's a line in the movie, um, <laughs> Tommy boy. I don't know if you guys ever saw it. It's Chris Farley and, and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, David Spade. Uh, and he was just like, yeah, a lot of people graduate college in eight years. Yeah, they're doctors. Um, and I don't have a doctor in front of my name. So uh, yeah, I was, like I mentioned, I was not the greatest of students, but once I found my rhythm in, in what I really truly wanted to do, um, it, it's just been a blessing. It's been fantastic. Um, if anybody else has a question, they can put it in the chat, which is down at the bottom of, um, of the screen. You can see it. You can click on it and just type your question there, or um, you can, um, hmm. oh, there you go. Uh, James, do I ever get to go surfing? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's kind of the funny part of life. Uh, so I got married, I had kids. Um, life kind of slowed my surfing down. Um, I still went occasionally, just not as frequently as I did when I was uh, younger. Um, I, I would love to get back out in the water, uh, more and more frequently. Uh, it's just something that it's like, um, for me, it's almost like a religious experience. Uh, every time I get into the water, anytime my, my feet are in the sand, um, anytime I smell the smell of a wetsuit or the, the smell of fiberglass from a surfboard, it's like I'm being baptized all over again. Um, and I, it's just, I, I love everything about surfing. So yeah, I would love to, to to make it more of a, a frequent uh, thing. But, be, you know, living up in Morris County, it takes a little bit longer to get to uh, the beach. So we'll, we'll see how my, my surfing career goes. Plus I've got a bump, bump shoulder, so that'll be interesting. So last time I actually went, I broke my toe, which was kind of fun. <laughs> Not really, but I was like, wow, I'm getting old. <laughs> Not fun. Um, I have a question for you, actually. I was sure. wondering, is, so everything's, obviously computerized now, but um, how's it changed in the last 20 years? And, and can you imagine what it was like to predict the weather 50 years ago or, oh, I mean, man. I can't imagine. 
so I mean the, the 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 process and the forecasting aspect of of forecasting has gotten easier as computers get faster. Um, the the more computing power we have, the better your forecast is going to get. Now, a forecast is never going to be perfect. Uh, we are we we can only get as close as possible. And the reason why the forecast is never going to be perfect is because we are dealing with a fluid system. The atmosphere is constantly moving. It's, it's a river of air. So when, when the air is constantly moving and we're trying to forecast that, what we do or what, what, what's done daily to get the parameters into those weather algorithms um, is we send up balloons. Uh, there are balloon launches twice a day, uh, once in the morning, once in the evening. Um, those balloons go up from the National Weather Service sites around the country. And as that balloon is rising through the atmosphere, there is a radio sound attached to it. And that is taking measurements at certain levels of the atmosphere. So as that balloon continues to rise, it's taking um, a snapshot of the temperature. It's taking a snapshot of the pressure of the moisture in the atmosphere, uh, how much solar radiation is, is reaching that particular point, and it's constantly going up. So what, what that, and uh, airplanes, airplanes have uh, weather sensors in the nose of the plane. So at 32,000, 40,000 feet, uh, wherever that plane is, it takes a snapshot. And that information is relayed back to these massive supercomputers. And those supercomputers are their job is to take all of that real-time weather data and then apply it to these really long weather algorithms. Um, at one point, I, I had heard the, the old giant stadium, one of my professors said this, it would take the, you know, I think it was 60 something thousand seats. If you filled the old giant stadium with the smartest mathematicians and scientists and you gave them each a piece of, you know, um, a puzzle to, to compute. It would take them a year. Each person in the state of 60,000 people, it would take a year to compute a one day forecast by hand. They were doing this by hand. Um, that's how much math goes into, into these, into these forecasts. And so why there is error and, you know, once you start going into the future. Um, for me as a meteorologist, um, I don't really trust anything after three days. So we, we give you the five day, there's a seven day, there's a 10 day forecast. Um, the errors start to get bigger the further down the road you get. And the reason for that is I was just mentioning the atmosphere is a fluid system. So what we do is the analogy, we take a picture, we take a snapshot of the atmosphere and then we apply science to it to come up with a forecast. Well, the issue is we're only taking a snapshot. The atmosphere is still moving down, down the road. So things happen, there's the chaos, there is a whole bunch of different things that, that can happen to interfere with that forecast. So the way I always look at um, you know, forecasting down the road is if you were to take a picture of someone playing basketball and you're on the sidelines, you've got your camera ready, and there's a fast break and the, the person's dribbling down the, down the court, no one's in front of him. And he goes up to do an easy layup. And as soon as he lets the ball go, you take a picture. Ball's coming out of his fingers, you take a picture. And it looks like from that picture, that ball is gonna go in. But what happens if the ball hits the backboard or hits the rim funny, it kind of bucks out. That's the error in the forecast down the road. So once we take the picture, it looks good, and it's probably good for, you know, 12 to 24 hours, but there's something going on in the atmosphere all around the globe that is going to interfere with that forecast down the road. And, I mean, computers are getting so much quicker, so much faster. Uh, just in the last 20 years alone, um, the computing power is phenomenal. Um, just think where, think where our computers are now from where they were, you know, 20 years ago. You know, it, it's amazing how fast the technology is going. And that's only going to help the, the, the science of meteorology. But I don't think it's ever going to be, you know, picture perfect. Um, James, is there a computer program that helps you predict the weather? 
Uh, no, well, there's there is there is a a couple of websites that have the guidance, the the computer models on them, but the computer guidance is just that. There there are flaws within the within the the guidance. So as a meteorologist, I have to know the flaws. I have to know the biases of each particular model. One particular model is usually a little bit more uh, overdone in precipitation. So during the winter months, uh, when we start to see these models come in, all of a sudden it shows this massive amount of potential snow. We have to realize that that model is over biasing that moisture. So you have to cut it back. So even though the model could say, you know, we're expecting 18 inches of snow, you have to realize well, the conditions might not always be there. So then you have to do a little bit of math, a little bit of science and a little bit of meteorology to um, try to get the, the best possible uh, result. And again, it's never going to be perfect, but you know, we try to, um, we try to be as, as close to uh, possible. Uh, Ian, do I have a favorite season for weather forecasting? Winter. Love snow. Absolutely love snow. Um, it's so challenging. Uh, because in the winter season, you know, one degree, one degree is the difference between rain and snow. And think about it, one degree. And that one degree is happening over our heads. So we don't really have thermometers up there. Uh, anything, you know, about the 2,000 feet, 2,000 to 3,500 feet above our heads. That's basically where the changeover happens. So you can, you can, it can snow and it can be 42 degrees out at the surface. Okay, you could, you could literally, it could be snowing and it's 42 at the ground. You're going, I thought it was too warm. 2,000 feet over your head, it's really cold. And as that precipitation is falling, it's falling in the form of snow. And then it gets a little bit wetter, but it's still snow at the, at the ground. Um, so forecasting, forecasting snow is so challenging, especially here in New Jersey, along the East Coast. Um, you could get storms that would be, you know, that'll blow up real quick just offshore. Uh, utilizing the real warm waters of the ocean, but the ocean can also screw up the forecast because it will bring in that warmer air aloft. So the computer models are going, no, it's going to be cold enough, but that warm air is going, no, it's not. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot that, that goes into each forecast. I love, you know, when I was, you know, I love winter forecasting, but forecasting hurricanes, uh, because that would always generate waves. And I was always, you know, into that. There was always that, that one thing about the, the tropical thing. Hey, bud, what are you doing? Sorry, my dog. You probably have heard him bark while doing forecasts. <laughs> hey, Rock, where are you? That's always the fun thing about working from home, too. You're sitting there doing a presentation, and in the background, you've got that. So that's what I found uh, quite challenging over the last seven months now. It's been seven months since I've been uh, in the studio. Um, and I kind, of, I kind of like it, and I kind of don't. Um, I love the fact that my commute is nothing. I love the fact that I haven't worn a tie in seven months. Uh, I haven't worn studio makeup in seven months. Um, I haven't worn pants. Now that's weird to say, but I mean, I'm usually wearing <laughs> shorts and slippers just because this is all you see. So it's, it's, it's better to be comfortable, I always, I always thought, than, than, you know, kind of getting all dressed up when you're at home. And I, I always thought it was weird that people were wearing... I have to eat. I worked all morning. Okay. You usually turn it that way. I know. It's kind of fun doing it this way, though. Okay. <laughs> Why did you sneak in? I was trying to hide so everybody wouldn't see me. Oh, okay. You don't have to sneak in. Dang, this is fun, right? Um... So yeah, I just, yeah, working from home has its challenges. Oh yeah. And from working, working too. from home, working from home, uh, you know, going into the studio also has its disadvantages. I got to go in and it's 45 minutes from my home. Uh, oh, yeah. You're just getting, you know, getting dressed. It's, there's, there's a lot. So it's, it's been kind of fun. <laughs> um, what is the scare? Oh, Jen. Oh, this is from somebody. Okay. So what is this? What's the scariest weather event you've ever had to announce? Um, Irene wasn't fun. Uh, Hurricane Sandy is definitely going down 
in, in my memory book. And the tornado from last May, that was, that was pretty something. But, um, her, her, hurricane, hurricane Sandy was the one that, you know, that was the first time that there was a landfalling hurricane that we saw the storm actually veer towards the coast. Um, that was the one that when everything kind of came together, you knew, uh, you knew how bad it was going to be. Um, and there's nothing you could do to stop it. Um, Hurricane Sandy, when we were, we were in studio, uh, we, the, the, the News 12 Super Studios are, is right at the edge of the Raritan River as it goes into the mouth of the Raritan Bay. So we're in, um... Fords, New Jersey, or by the uh, the Expo Center, and our studios, you know, as the crow flies, I guess we're maybe a mile from from water, and the the tides were so bad, we had a thirteen foot storm surge, and that water, you know, over five days. The winds were, the prevailing winds were northeasterly. That was pushing all that ocean water up against the beaches for five days. Uh, it was pushing water through the, because what happens is, is that rivers usually go to the ocean. Well, this was actually pushing ocean water through the Raritan Bay and up the Raritan River. The, the river was reversed for about three days. Um, so the tides kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, at one point, we were, we were in the middle of broadcasting. I was... I was, I was 13 hours straight of, of doing weather. And at one point I had a break. The anchors were taking over. They were talking about, you know, a bunch of different things that were going on. We, we, I, I had like maybe about 15 minutes to go to the bathroom, get something to drink, and then, you know, come back on, on air. And as I was walking out of the studio, I, I was hearing a car alarm. And I'm like, well, that's odd. You know, we'd all rushed out at one point, you know, at night to, you know, open the back doors to hear the wind howling and, and see how, you know, bad things were getting, the trees were, were swaying. And at one point, you know, I, I went out there and it was, it was quiet. Um, there wasn't really much going on. And then the, the second time I went out there, all of a sudden, the back parking lot is filled with water. We had dumpsters smashing into cars. That was the car alarms that were going off. And the water was surrounding the studio. So we had this mad dash to get all of these, all of these cars up and out. Um, it was just, it was just one of, it was, it was one of the, one of the more surreal moments of, of forecasting where all of a sudden I thought to myself, instead of reporting on the weather and reporting on this weather story, I'm going to become the weather story when the studio gets cut off and now the water's starting to come into uh, the studio. Cause it was, I mean, it was rising fast. Wow. Um, and then the water just kind of, you know, surrounded the whole building. We were just like, wow, this is going to get bad quick. Um, so that was, that was probably one of the scariest. And then the tornado coverage in May, because it happened at night. Uh, it lasted so long and you, you just, you didn't, you know, the only thing that we, we had to go on was, was radar and you couldn't see anything. It was, the tornado was wrapped in rain, so no one could see what was going on. So that was, that was, that's, that's unnerving. You know, I'm, I, I love, I love weather. I love everything about it. I love, you know, forecasting storms. I love forecasting severe thunderstorms. I love forecasting the snow, hurricanes and all that other stuff, but I don't want to see it do anything bad. You know, I, it's just, you're, you just can't stop it. You can't do anything. It's, it's, very, it's very unnerving to, to know it's coming and not be able to do anything yeah. about it. And you just gotta you, must, go. you must have the most helpless feeling when, yeah. when that happens. And the rest of us are kind of thinking, well, we don't really know how bad it's going to be, but you know. Yeah, and, and you're just sitting there and you, you're, you don't want to be too alarmist. Um, because if it doesn't happen the way you think it's going to happen, then you... you Hey, why didn't that happen? Um, so that you know, you, you're darned if you do, you're darned if you don't. Um, in this position, which is which is fine, but when you, when you see something like that, and you're just going, this is going to be bad, and it'll be bad for you know one one group of people, but the other group of people, 
not necessarily, you know, might not be dealing as bad. So we're trying to tell the story. You're, you're focusing on the worst part, obviously. Right. Um, but there's other parts of the area that you also have to incorporate into that weather story to say, hey, listen, it may not be as bad for you, but you could have, you know, X, Y, Z still happen to your home or to, you know, life around you. So that's always, that's, that's the one part of my job that's fun and not fun at the same time. So we're asked, we just asked everyone to unmute themselves because I think if maybe some people might not know how to use the chat feature and if you have a question that you want to ask um, in person, just go ahead and, yeah. and do that. Um, and while we, while we wait for that, I'll ask you another question, which is um, kind of what you're saying. I, it's just a two-part question. Do you ever, um, are you ever forced or kind of encouraged, I guess is a better word, to report a forecast as more sensational than you feel comfortable with? No. That's good to know. Well, so um, management would <laughs> like you to be a responsible alarmist um, because a tease so, so television is, is in the, in the, the we, we still want to make money. And we, we, the way a television station makes money is by commercials. So how do you get an audience to stick around, right? Um, how, how, do we get the, how do we get an audience to, to watch the show and stay through the commercial? That's, that's what television is. It's based on the commercials and the, and the ads. Um, in a great way to get someone's attention is to have an amazing tease. Um, you could sit there and say, weather's been great, Sunny's, sunny and 60, but I gotta tell you something, by next week, it's getting so cold, there's the possibility of snow here in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Stick around, your exclusive 10 day forecast is coming up. <laughs> Wait, he just said snow, I yeah. have to sit and watch. <laughs> so that's, that's something that you have to, you're, you're, you're really walking a very fine line. Um, and what I have found nowadays is that it's not necessarily you find that on television. You don't really find those bombastic teases where, holy cow, 38 inches of snow coming up on October 10th. Um, stick around, your forecast is coming. You don't find that anymore. But what you do find is irresponsible pages on social media. Um, it's very hard for folks to be on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, uh, and to know what is a reliable weather source um, because there's a lot out there. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a lot of people playing Jim Cantori on social media. And what they'll do is they will read into the face value of a computer model that would say, wow, 32 inches of snow coming, you know, in 36 hours. They don't realize how to read the models. They're not meteorologists. So what they'll do is they come up with a post. They put a picture of the model up. And now there's your sensationalism on social media that part of my job now is to debunk or say, yeah, I kind of agree with it. So what I've been doing is filtering through comments or filtering through posts that say, Hey Dave, did you see what's happening on the GFS at, you know, 200 hours? Yeah. So-and-so on, on social media said, this is going to happen. Yeah. No, I, that's, that's, that's one of the bad things of, of social media. Social media for me um, allows me to get my News 12 forecast out to the public that may not have News 12. Um, but it's also that same, that same demographic is getting their information from somewhere else. And now it's like, all right, I've got to, I've got to figure it, figure it out. Um, oh. So are there any other meteorologists that you're friends with? Well, I, everybody at, at News 12, um, we all, you know, are in constant contact with each other. Um, uh, you know, you go to, 
you know, uh, uh, conferences. The American Meteorological Society has conferences um, two or three a year. Um, and that's, you know, everybody from around the country kind of gets together. Um, I, uh, am I friends with Lee Goldberg? No. Um, have I conversed with him before? Yes. Um, so it's more of the, the people on my team. I've got, you know, a couple of, you know, people that uh, have been interns of mine that have, you know, gone on to other, other areas, which is kind of fun to see how they're, how they're progressing in their, in their TV stations. Um, and sometimes, you know, there's a group of us that will sit there and, and we'll be in a, a chat and you're, you're just throwing scenarios out there. Well, hey, this storm reminds me of, you know, 1996 and here's why, why, why. And then another meteorologist will go, hey, but did you look at this? So it's, it's kind of a great think tank to constantly talk to, um, to other people. And, and, and figure out what, did I miss something in the forecast? Oh, maybe I did. Or maybe I have something that I can interject to make the forecast that much better. Um, how do you forecast a line between rain in Morristown and snow in Sparta? That's hard. Uh, and it all depends on what the atmosphere is doing. Each, each storm setup is going to be different. Um, which way the winds are blowing, um, uh, how cold it's going to be um, at a certain point. Um, in not only the surface, but, but a loft uh, over our head. Um, and, you know, I always, I've always said in my forecast that the northwest corner of New Jersey is made up from 287 and Interstate 80 north and west. That, to me, is the northwest corner. That's where, you, and you, you also have hill, hillier terrain of Bergen County. You have the valleys of, of Warren County that can trap cold air. So, um, what, what I'm doing when I'm forecasting, you know, snow and rain is I'm looking at a, a thickness line in the atmosphere. It's a specific thickness. It's 540 decameters. And that in meteorology is the magic rain snow line. Um, if you are below that 540 line, it is going to be rain. If you are behind that 540 line, it's going to be colder it has a better opportunity at supporting snow. So it's, each storm is different. Um, each storm path is different. So you're, if I'm looking for a rain snow line, the magic, that magic line is the 540 decameter line. And that's, that's what you're looking at. And then of course you're looking at biases on the, on the computer models because each computer model will place that 540 line in a different spot. So which computer model is trending colder? Which one has a bias, has a, has a warm temperature bias? Uh, these are all things that have to kind of be brought into each and every forecast every day. So it's not like I am, you know, sitting at my desk throwing darts at a, at a dartboard going, I want it to be sunny today. Sometimes I have done that though. Mm -hmm. Not really, but. Um, anybody else have any questions? I mean, you can ask me anything. Can you guys hear my dogs barking? He's whining because there's food back there. It's a bummer. <laughs> we can hear him. Yeah, good, good, good. That's what I thought. He's cute. I have a question. I just put it in the chat box. Chat box. I have a question by text. Do people ever complain or get angry about missed forecasts? You have no idea. <laughs> I would imagine with, with social media, it's hard social to- Social media is brutal. I hate yeah. social media because of that. Social media is so mean. Um, people are so- emboldened and brave behind their their computer desk and typing away they would never say the things that that they say on the computer if you were face to face never i guarantee it they would never ever do it and that's why if there's like young people out there right now um or parents of young people tell them this um social media is stupid and life isn't about that um it's yeah i mean i can get uh, anything from, uh, the way your hair looks, the way your tie, why did you wear that certain tie? Uh, Hey, you're looking a little chubby in that suit to, um, wow, you blew that forecast, didn't you? Thank you for, um, uh, not having, you know, if you called like a snow day and it wasn't that bad, um, people, you know, work was canceled. Well, people lost out on money. That that comes back at you as well. So, um, 
that that comes with the the territory and if if anyone was ever thinking about getting into television uh the one thing that i could say to them is to make sure you have a thick skin um because the comments uh that are hurled at you are are crazy um not deserved uh in certain respects i mean if there's if there's weather if you're going to critique the weather i'm off with that um but like once once you start getting into you know looks i mean i a couple of you know i i follow ginger z on online and some of the stuff that is hurled her way and she's like you know on a national level for um uh good morning america you're like what don't you have anything else better to do on social media or online instead of yeah that yellow suit that yellow tie just doesn't do it for you thanks that's, yeah yeah that's just the, that's the weird part social media is, is good it's great and it's bad at the same time yep um susan jacobs what will this winter be like this wow. is always this is always i know i know it's beyond things. your few days um <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get through a day-to-day -day forecast <laughs> without getting yelled at. Um, and then a lot of everyone goes, well, how's the summer going to be? How's the winter going to be? Um, and when we do these long range forecasts, uh, we are looking at, we're not looking at um, daily models. We're looking at climate models. We're looking at stuff that goes out 90 days. And I just told you, you know, the snapshot, my analogy of the, the snapshot, we're taking a snapshot of the forecast and then kind of spinning it. Well, when we look at when we look at climate models, we're we're not necessarily we're, we're looking at the atmosphere, but we're also looking at the ocean. The ocean is a huge driver of how our weather will develop. Uh, you've heard of El Nino, uh, that is the warming of the equatorial um, uh, the equatorial Pacific. Uh, there's La Nina. Uh, that is the cooling of the equatorial Pacific. And when that Pacific, because and you have to remember that weather travels from west to east. So if we're going to look at that long range climate pattern, you're always looking at the west. We're looking at the Pacific Ocean to see how our weather is going to um, fare down the road. And right now we are in a La Nina period. Um, and it's a pretty strong La Nina period. Uh, which will mean that the, there's a couple things that we look at. We look at the La Nina, there's the, the Pacific Decadal op, uh, Oscillation, which actually shows sea surface temperatures, um, which, th again, there's a lot that goes into it. So what we're looking for is what particular climate pattern is going to buckle the jet stream? What particular pattern is going to throw a ridge in the West, which is like a, a big... Uh, actually, you know what? I have something. Let me see if I can share this. Um, share screen. Hold, please. Uh, do I want to go here? Yeah, I think I want to go there. Hang on a second. Let me see if I could share this. So this is, I'll get rid of that, and then I'm going to get rid of this, and hang on. That's, <laughs> I'll get rid of that. Oh, hey, email. Close that. Um, <laughs> this right here. This is a La Nina picture. I was doing, I was actually doing some homework. Uh, okay, hi, there we go. So this is basically what we would look at, uh, a typical um, weather pattern when we're in a La Nina. So when I say a ridge, a ridge is this area of high pressure out towards the west. This is taking the jet stream and bumping it all the way up towards Alaska. This ridge means warmth out towards the west. So you've heard the, the expression, if something goes up, something goes down. <laughs> Well, the jet stream's going up towards Alaska, which is bringing warmer air, but the colder air is now allowed to drop down into the northern plains in the northeast. So a La Nina pattern would favor a little more cold and a little bit, uh, it'll, favor, it'll favor a colder weather pattern and it'll favor a stormy weather pattern. Now, do the two meet up? That's when we're trying to predict snow, right? Um, do you have the moisture in place and do you have the cold air in place, which would produce snow? And um, this particular pattern, again, this is an average, shows this trough that drops down into the west, which allows that cold Canadian air to drop into the, the northeast. To get these blockbuster snow events, we need storms that will form in the Gulf of Mexico or uh, form in the Atlantic 
uh, and basically ride to our south and stay within what we call the 4070 benchmark. It's the 40, 4070 longitude latitude line. When we get a, an area of low pressure, um, do you see the little cross mark where my cursor is? Um, it's basically just above the M in warmer and the triangle. Um, if you get a, an area of low pressure that is basically just south of Montauk, Long Island, that usually means that New Jersey gets crushed with snow. And I have, an, I, I have a, a feeling um, that our, that our, 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 our weather pattern this year is, is going to be an active one. So when I compare this winter to last winter, Yes, it's going to be colder and, and snowier because last year stunk. Um, this year is going to be totally different. I, I think we'll probably have a slightly above average snowfall, which for us is, I think it's 41 inches. That's over the year. That's for um, December 1st to um, February 28th. Um, that would be in the, 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 the winter year. So... I think we are, we're going to see a bunch of clipper systems. You'll hear me talking about clipper systems. They're, they're fast movers. Um, they're usually, uh, they don't have a lot of moisture with them, but there's enough cold air to squeeze out any available moisture that we see like a, a one to two inch, one to three inch snowfall. Those add up. And then I think we have, I think we have two good nor'easters in us this year. I'm looking at the, what I look at now for winter forecasting is how does the storm track, how do the fall storm tracks set up? Now, even though we didn't really have that many, it's been pretty dry in September. October and November is going to be very telling in how our storm tracks are going to set up. Um, and right now I've seen a couple that are an indicator that I think we may have some, some nor'easters, possible nor'easters. Now again, it, it all, it, it, a difference of 15 miles means everything. Uh, in, in weather. And, you know, try telling that to somebody in Ship Bottom, New Jersey, and somebody that is in Upper Freehold. You know, there, there's, there's, it's a, there's a huge difference of what you can see in a very short uh, time. So to, to, answer, to answer your question, <laughs> winter's going to be fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> James fun for me. Fun for me, anyway. Maintenance me. on your snowblower. <laughs> uh, James Bailey, do I trust the Farmer's Almanac? So I used to work with the gentleman who actually made the forecasts for the uh, Farmer's Almanac. Uh, and he would make those forecasts two years in advance. Those <laughs> forecasts are based off of lunar cycles. Every 19 years, the moon is in the same spot in the sky. And the moon governs tides, right? Um, the moon, you know, if the, if the moon can govern the oceans and tides of water body, it can also govern the atmospheric tides. And he has come up with, um, an unscientific, uh, forecast that he's, he's only during the winter months is about 55% correct on some of the stuff that he does. Um, the farmer's almanac is fun to look at. Um, it's very vague. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, something to consider when you're reading the Farmer's Almanac. There's a lot of great articles in the Farmer's Almanac, but as far as a day-to-day -day forecast, a week-to-week, month-to-month forecast, mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of that, no. Mm -hmm. But there, there have been some, some cases where I have used his formulas um, in the fall to kind of find a setup and figure out when we could potentially see a storm. And it, it, it's, it's worked in the past uh, to a certain degree, um, but my dad always said a blind squirrel will eventually get a nut. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's there too. Um, and have I, have I maintenance my snowblower? No, not yet. No, not yet. I will. And once I do that, you know that mountain lakes is not going to get any snow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, can you answer Tara's question above that? Sure. Uh, Tara, Tara, Tara. Oh yeah. Uh, do you feel that the weather events have become more extreme over the years or do you think it's just the sensational, uh, well, uh, that's a combination of both. Um, weather events have become more extreme. 
we have seen um, more and more coastal flooding um, all over the place. Uh, you could, Venice, Italy, uh, they have not experienced that kind of flooding in um, decades. Uh, again, weather, climate, everything is cyclical. Um, everything happens. There's, 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 two, there's floods and there's droughts uh, because of the way the climate patterns shape up around the, around the world. Um, everyone has a phone now. Everyone can document. And this is also helping the science of meteorology uh, and climate. Everyone has a phone. Everyone has social media. We see these accounts. We see how the daily weather um, and is matching up with the climate. Um, so it's, it's very exciting to see how everything is coming together right now. Is it sensationalized sometimes? Yeah. Um, I, I am, a, I am a, I'm not a climate denier. I, I'm also, people say, are, are we responsible? Are, is it, are humans solely responsible for the warming of the earth? Um, Yes, uh, we are. Uh, and it's not necessarily because of the cars that we're driving. It's not necessarily because of the, the planes that we're you know, going on, on trips with. That leaves a carbon footprint, absolutely. Um, and we can, we can cut back on that. We can do our part by recycling. We could do, you know, you can try to do, you know, green things um, instead of, you know, the way we've been doing it. You try to limit pollution. Um, but my big thing about climate is the stripping of the earth. Dogs walking outside, dogs walking their dog. Mine are happy to say hi. Um, so just going back to, to climate and what I, what I think is actually happening. Um, we are taking so much land and paving it that that is allowing the earth to warm a lot faster. You start stripping trees um, to make a new Whole Foods, um, you're, you've now taken the earth's ability to eat carbon dioxide. Um, again, I, I've been trying not to eat meat, um, but you think about, you know, the, the uh, the Amazon, that's literally the Earth's lungs. And we're burning it to make uh, pastures for cows so they can eat. Now cows eat a lot of grass. They also produce a lot of methane. Methane is horrible for the atmosphere. Methane comes from cow stuff. So the more they eat, the more they, and the more methane is produced. Um, without those trees to eat, the methane to eat the carbon dioxide, it goes up into the atmosphere. It creates, you know, that, that, that ozone hole. Um, there's a lot of things that go into it. You know, we, a lot of things that you hear is like, oh, you know, you've got oil, you've got um, uh, coal, which, yeah, you're stripping the land. You, you, we, should, we have to try to limit that. What we should do, what I would hope that developers would start to do instead of taking a plot of land that has, has woods on it and stripping it, stripping it to make um, a Shake Shack or a Whole Foods. And I love Whole Foods, by the way, don't get me wrong. Um, but isn't there an abandoned building somewhere that we could utilize to do that? Um, put something, let's utilize what we have on the ground now instead of opening up more real estate and stripping trees. I think that's honestly one of the bigger reasons. And, and, and to prove my point here, uh, Reagan International Airport um, was noticing over the last two years, temperatures rising dramatically. And scientists are sitting there going, what is going on? Why, why are the temperatures constantly going up in the Washington DC area? And the, the final thought that came out of this was, is that the airport was expanding. And the, the meteorological instrumentation that was on a grassy surface, which had a little bit of tree coverage for shade and stuff like that, they ate into that. They brought the pavement closer to the meteorological instrumentation. Pavement holds heat. So you've heard of the heat island effect. Cities are warmer than the countryside because mm -hmm. the grass can absorb, the trees can absorb the sun's heat. Pavement, um, or it, 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 the, the, the grass and the, the trees, they absorb it and they let it back out. 
the pavement holds it. So it, it, it will sit in the pavement, it'll sit in the sidewalks and it, it's just hotter. So it will radiate as more heat. So the more pavement we throw down, the more sidewalks we throw down, um, the more residential new things that were popping up all over the world, that's going to lead to uh, a rise in temperatures. We're also, you know, we could be looking at that cyclical aspect to um, the earth in and of itself has warming periods and cooling periods. We had a little ice age, we have, we've had ice ages. And this is gonna be kind of interesting. So the reason why we have ice ages is because the, the sun is not producing enough energy. So the sun basically is, is the earth's life force. We are, we are at a perfect spot in space from that heat source where life can, can develop and form. The sun is going into an 11 year solar minimum. So the output from the sun is gonna be less. Technically, if this was the 17 or 1800s, without you know, what we've been, you know, what we've been you know, marketing, the earth should technically cool. Um, we would see bigger periods of ice in the Great Lakes and in the Arctic Circle. We would see, you know, your, you know, mountain lake would be colder longer, be icier longer. We're now in year two, I believe of that. Uh, yeah, we're going into year two of that solar minimum and the temperatures are still going up. That's the scary part. We should be cooling down and we're not. So what happens when the earth or what, what happens when the sun starts to produce that solar output? Um, that's, that's where, you know, that's where things are going to start getting interesting, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, 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 that's a, the kind of scary part of, of the, the world that we live in. Um, a lot of folks take it for granted. Um, and with pollution and with littering and just think of, think of, think of this big blue marble as, as literally your home, your property. You wouldn't litter on your property. Why would you do it anywhere else? You know, just find a, find a way to, to do your part and, and make it, make it a little bit better. There, I'm going to step off my soapbox now. I think that's wise advice. I think we should all take it. Um, well, I don't want to keep you any longer on your day off. So if there aren't, are there any further questions? You can ask me anything. Yeah, I'll give it another second or two. And if not, then I will just say, Dave, thanks so much. for. No, thank you. Today. This was fun. This was great. I think we learned a lot. And um, we'll see you on TV. Yes. Thank tomorrow, you very much. I, I, I appreciate the, uh, the viewership. And if, if you haven't um, followed me on social media and my antics there, um, it's Dave's Forecast on Instagram, at Dave's Forecast on Instagram. Um, Twitter is? Twitter is, I think, Dave Curran. And then if you look up on Facebook, uh, I think it's Facebook backslash Dave's forecast. You'll get to my, my, that uh, professional page. I don't even, and I have a, I have a personal Facebook page that I, I never go on because I just don't like social media. Yeah. Well, um, it, it has become so toxic. Yeah. It has become so toxic. So it's like, I, I do my thing on there to try and lighten it. Um, I will do, I mean, I, I'm usually posting early in the morning. So it's when I just wake up hairs all over the place, still haven't shaved, drinking a cup of coffee. And I'm like, oh, hey, let's get the forecast. Um, or posting fun memes just to make, just to make light of this crazy time that we're in. Yeah, we have to do that, right? Every, I think everyone should smile. Well, I love that your dogs are in the background of your forecast, so. Yeah, anyone want one? <laughs> I have <laughs> enough, thank you. No? <laughs> All right, everybody, um, this recorded uh, talk will be on our library website and also on our Facebook page. I think we put the um, 
where you can find Dave on social media to follow him and maybe give him some positive comments to counteract all of that. You, you can also you can also bust my chops about a bad forecast too. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Just don't tell me I look fat in a suit. I promise. <laughs> let's let's all agree to that. All right, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank Have you a guys. Wonderful afternoon. Thank you. And, um, we'll see you soon. Take Have care. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Why don't you go to the beach? Why don't you go to the beach?